I'm sure the Apple will fix the lights out. Will you be able to put those lights out for remote control? I really just need to start the other one and then tap again because you've got to thumb over and put the slides over. And you're happy to go on the Yep. And we've got the cameras all well asleep. They're all good. So I really know what's what's good. And I'll be able to work on it after this is all. I'll be able to see that fine. Do you want me to swing this camera around? Do you want me to swing this camera around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. really great to be back here again. I um, gave a presentation last year on color theory and I'm happy to come back and talk about glazing because it talks about a lot of the same issues and the whole reason that we glaze is to bring out the color and the saturation in the paints which I find really exciting. I'm mainly an oil painter but I've been painting acrylics for years and I'm very interested in the translation of oil techniques into acrylic because acrylic is much more democratic, more people can use it, a lot of people have sensitivities and allergies to oil paint. And so I really like that just about everyone can use acrylic paint, and so I'd like to see these techniques translated. So um, I brought some slides to show just to give you an idea of what people are doing today in glazing. Um, most people have been to an art museum and seen what people did 150, 200 years ago, uh, so I won't bore you with that stuff. But there are a lot of people working contemporarily with glazes, and so I'd like to show some of that. Um, so if we could go ahead and go to the slideshow. The first person I'd like to take a note of is Odd Nerger. He's, um, he's from Norway, and he's a very interesting painter. Um, they say he's a modern-day Rembrandt. He's got a, um, a penchant for very dark spaces and using honey-like consistency of paint with these kind of um, amber-infused sunset backgrounds that are pretty amazing. And um, this is a self-portrait as the prophet of painting. And... Um, he comes across as being a bit up, up himself, but he's actually got a very interesting slant on art, and he calls himself a kitsch painter. And I won't go into that here. You can look it up um, on Google. But basically he talks about, because he puts a lot of sunsets into his paintings, and he's really looking at human flesh and the sensitivity um, of the texture and the color of flesh, he's actually not interested in, in contemporary art and being edgy, but he's actually interested in ideas of nostalgia, sensitivity, and he uses the word kitsch um, as a way to just... Um, poke a bit of fun at himself and not take himself too seriously. But I find his, his paintings extremely serious. Um, if we go to the next one, um, you'll see that uh, a lot of his stuff you, you would describe as disturbing. Um, he paints amputees and he paints people. In, um, he, since he loves flesh, a lot of his figures are nude. And whereas Degas would put them in the bath or coming out of the bath, he tends to choose other type of subjects that let him do the nude figure, um, but in a much more interesting way. Looks like this guy's been run over by a car and had his entrails ripped out. But you can see that um, on the chest especially, uh, the way he uses glazes really gives the, um, the, the Caucasian flesh that kind of almost translucent quality that you get. And you can tell if something's sweaty and you can tell if something's got a bit of a tan or something's close to a mucous membrane. And it's got all those different um, colors. And I just find it really wonderful. It, it really questions whether he's using paint or whether he's actually using flesh. I think it's really fantastic. But um, you can look him up. His, his name is really hard to forget, Odd, Odd Nerdrum, and um, he's one of my favorites. But if we go to the next one, um, this is more of, of a contemporary feel, I think, with as far as the color usage. And this is Ed Paschke. He went to um, the same university I went to in Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, 
Um, he passed away a couple of years ago, but I had the the chance to hear him talk about his art back in 2001 when I was studying there. And um, these are really large scale works, two to three meters, um, two by three meters probably this one is. And he likes to take um, faces from either pop culture. He did one of um, Dennis Rodman, the, the basketball player. But he also takes them from um, iconic kind of classical Greek and Roman sculptures and, um, and then adds these patterns almost in like a tattoo type style and then glazes the colors on. And um, his main interest is are, are these really intense colors. He calls them like a Kool-Aid acid test um, style color scheme. And um, you can see that they're really used to a beautiful decorative effect. Some of these colors used on their own in, in a landscape might seem a bit um, gaudy or um, garish, but here they have a really nice kind of pattern to them, almost um, the quality of like a peacock or something like that. And I think that they're really fantastic in that sense. If we go to the next one, um, this is a, a self-portrait, I believe. And again, he's kind of working with the idea of a tattoo, um, or incised flesh, and then he just puts that yellow glaze over the top, and it just really glows. And I don't know how much you know about, about the actual uh, scientific effects of glazing, but it's a lot like a stained glass window. And basically, um, when you use paints in an alla prima way, that is, taking them straight from the tube and putting them on the canvas in an opaque fashion, um, we perceive the color by the sunlight hitting that, the pigments in that paint and bouncing off into our eyes. The thing that makes this very different is that it's actually like a stained glass window in that it's a, it's a completely transparent layer of color and the light is going through to the white canvas underneath, bouncing back out through that thin sheen of green or yellow paint and then we're actually perceiving a glowing. It's very similar, to, I think, to a, a computer screen which is projecting light. And I, I always get that sense when I'm looking at glazed paintings. You can sense the light that's being directed through the canvas and back out to, towards your eye. And that's what really gives it that luminous quality. Um, it can, in old master paintings, um, one of the ways that you can kind of distinguish a master from maybe the school of is a lot of times the handling of the glazes. Because if they're put on too heavy, a lot of times they can have this oversaturated effect. And you wouldn't call this a realistic flesh tone. And Ed Paschke's not very, very interested in that. He's more interested in just the use of pure color. And he's using the figure as a subject to work with. But um, when you start trying to get realistic flesh tones, um, you find that you, know, you have to have a really light, sensitive touch. Otherwise, they do, the colors do tend to get too saturated. And that's why the old masters used the, the glazing technique. Was um, Up until about 100 years ago, they re were really messing with about 8 to 12 colors, and none of them were really saturated. So to get the most out of those colors by using an indirect technique, and I'll, I'll show you something that I've done um, a little bit later, it actually takes advantage of the, the pigments and gets the most saturation out of them that you can. Ed Paschke is a good example of this. If we go to the next one, um, I was going to show my favorite Australian version of the, um, a, a good modern glazer, and that's Tim McGuire. And he's been doing this for decades. Um, it's, a mu it's a much more scientific approach. He actually takes these photos and puts them into Photoshop and separates them into three colors and figure out exact, fig figures out where he needs to put the uh, cyan, yellow, and magenta to make these wonderful colors. And he also uses splatter techniques, drip techniques, and things like that to, um, to make the paint application much more interesting. But I just find his use of color is so stunning. He's not afraid to use really, really bold colors. It becomes decorative, but um, because of the cropped image and the blown up scale, they really become much more like abstract paintings than um, flower studies. If we go to the next one, um, I find this one extremely abstract. It's like an explosion of color. And so I think he's, he's really fabulous pushing um, the glaze techniques. And he's actually moved on now to um, doing things with light boxes behind to, to get even more color. And it's interesting when you see, when you really look at the artists who are using glazing, um, it has less to do with a duplication of reality and more of just a pure interest in color, which I find um, is very interesting as a painter. It's great to see people using color. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, this is George Innes. This is going back about 120 years. Um, he was an American um, painter in New England, painting upstate New York and a lot of those landscapes. He uses a lot of glazing. And I wanted to bring him in and just show um, this one and the next one especially um, because I did a little study of this in 
acrylics to show you. So if we could just go to the next slide. Um, I did a study of that on this little panel. I'll show you here in a second. But I really love these, and they're really all about glazing. Um, whereas the Impressionists would tend to, uh, the French Impressionists would tend to paint things in full sun, and you get light and shade in this... Um, the kind of dancing surface of light on the landscape. Innes was mostly interested in um, times of day where the light was, was very moody and had a nuance of very saturated color, twilight and uh, sunrise and sunset. And I think you can see that the burning sun in that is just so intense. And I don't believe in 1892 when this was painted that he would have had any cadmiums. And so really the only way to get that burning sun would be to, um, to, to just glaze orange colors over like a transparent red oxide or maybe some alizarin or something like that mixed with a bit of um, areolin or yellow to get that really bright sun and um, I'm going to try to bring my little painting up and try to get that to be as intense as possible today so we can play around with that but before we get started with the with the glazing I want to talk about uh, the very beginnings of the painting and the interesting thing with with glazing and glazed paintings is they're often very thin um, uh, not yet. And so if we go to the next one, um, this is a Rubens. This is from the Maria de' Medici series. Um, and this is the study for the large paintings that he did that are in the Louvre. And, um, and you can see if you look behind the boat and to the bottom right and the left, there's this yellow that's coming through from the background. And Rubens often used a, a yellow priming. Um, I've been told that... Um, he would oftentimes just take yellow ochre, a bit of black, and a bit of white, smear it on his canvases, and have a, a quite a streaky effect. And that would give him a mid-tone ground to work on. So that's called the imprimatura, or the, um, or the, uh, the uh, priming. And so I want to start by talking about primings. And I wanted to show this yellow Rubens one because I've, I've got some examples that I'm going to show from that. If we go to the next one, um, which is a picture by Velasquez, I just want to contrast the Rubens' yellow with this slight greenish one. Um, it's a bit fuzzy, but literally, that's just a stroke of burnt umber to delineate the pillow that she's working on. And almost this entire area is just the priming, that he's, the color he started with. And um, generally, most of the old masters started with a priming because it gives them a mid-tone ground from which they can put light and dark on and work in two directions, push and pull. Um, the colors that they used varied over the centuries. The very beginning um, kind of middle Italian paintings, 15th century Raphael and um, Leonardo were working on kind of a darker kind of burnt sienna, transparent red oxide ground. And I'll show you again that I've used that as well. But it's quite a dark ground. And I find that Velasquez is green and Rubens is yellow from the mid-Baroque. is just a perfect mid-tone ground to work on. And I find also the yellow and the green really help out the flesh tones, which I'll go into in a bit as well. Um, do we have one more slide or... That's it? Okay, let's go ahead and have the lights and I'll, um, I'll start showing you some of the things that I brought. So I've prepared some priming here just to show you some of the different results. This is a transparent red oxide. And um, this is probably what would have been most popular in the 15th century with Raphael. Um, it's a very transparent pigment, and you can see the variation in it. I just put it on and brushed it around with this big brush, and um, really got quite a bit of variation. Rubens would have had even more variation. Um, same with Leonardo. Leonardo liked to say that to get an idea for a picture, you throw a wet rag on this plaster wall and look at the same shape of it and then make a picture out of that. And I reckon Rubens did the same with uh, his street primings. He would see something like rain coming down or clouds or whatever and use that as a, a starting point for his paintings. And I think that that's a really interesting way to paint. So I've got this one. And um, this one here is the yellow ochre mixed with um, carbon black and a bit of white. And I tried to do it as loose as possible and not mix the paint together so there'd be a bit of variation. And there's a bit more black in areas and a bit more white in other areas. But um, you'll see later when, uh, with, the other, with the paintings that I've worked up that it actually does influence it. And that's one of the really exciting things about looking at old master paintings is that when you get really close and look into the back, you can often find the priming coming through in different areas. They call it a reserve. And the reason that they use reserves in oil painting is because 
The slow drying time of oils means that if it doesn't dry properly and there's layers over other layers, then it can buckle, it can blister, it can crack, it can fall off. We don't have to worry about the acrylics, but um, it does influence the way the old masters painted. painted. So they would leave these reserves, um, areas of the ground showing through, so that the little islands of painted color could dry not only from the top, but from the sides as well. Very interesting. And um, so if you do get up close to some of these old master paintings, I always find it's really interesting to look in the dark areas. Often um, you can see some burnt umber from the very bottom layers. And that was just a way to, for them to allow the paintings to dry properly. But it really gives us a way to look into the way that the painter painted it and to, to see the techniques and how they come alive because there's not a lot of covering up. So, um, and because of that, that will influence the overall color scheme of the painting. And that's going back to what I was saying about Rubens and Velasquez and their colors. So I made this little chart to explain that in greater detail. Um, basically what I did was I made, a, made four different primings. So here we've got the uh, transparent red oxide, which is this kind of uh, exemplary of the 15th century Italian. This is Venetian red. It's a, Matisse makes a really wonderful transparent Venetian red, which I think is fantastic. I've got um, in oil, whenever I work um, on these, Generally, I use an opaque Venetian red, and it's so dark, it becomes a dark tone. And you, you can get really good chiaroscuro like um, um, Leonardo or uh, Caravaggio. But I find if you want a more of a realistic range of tones, it helps to have more of a mid-tone. And that's why I use this transparent Venetian red, which is pretty fantastic. Now, this here is the yellow ochre mixed with a little bit of black and white. And then this is a chromium green oxide which is actually a very traditional pigment for primings as well. This is what I would say that the Velasquez's are very similar to, and you can see down there. Um, so I've put these primings down, and then I, I wanted to put some white as a circle and then glaze on top of the white. But with white, we've got several options as well. I think that everybody knows the obvious titanium white. Since I've been painting in oils, I've been using flake white, which is based on lead. And it's highly toxic. It kills people all the time. I've been told not to use it, but I can't stop. It's fantastic. Um, but it's slightly transparent, and it has that luscious quality of color that you find in human skin. I find titanium white just doesn't do that. So luckily, Matisse makes what is called antique white. And I find that it's just nice and warm. So I've got three whites up here. The top one's titanium white. You can see how nice and clean that is. The one just under that is this antique white. And you can just slightly see the, 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 uh, the priming coming through that, which means it's slightly transparent and it's slightly warmer than the titanium white. So to me, this is my equivalent to flake white, and it's non-toxic, which is pretty good. Now, they also make an unbleached titanium. And so um, you can see that's the third one down. It's not quite as opaque as titanium white, and it's much, much warmer. Um, it's almost a flesh tone in itself. And I'm hesitant. Um, I've never kind of messed around with flesh tint, um, it's, it's really good for certain things. It's a wonderful earth color. But I like to mix my own. So I think what I'm going to stick to is this antique white, which is semi-transparent and slightly warm. So I've, I've made little circles of antique white um, in kind of a thin scumble. And then I've put a little bit of a thicker version. And then I've put an opaque version on top just as a highlight. And then that way we can see the glaze and see how the colors come through. Now, after I put that on, um, I mix up four glazing colors. And I'd like to stop right now and just talk about the difference between transparent and opaque pigments and how that will affect glazing. Basically, um, you can test any of your colors that you've got at home to see if they're going to be good for glazing just with a simple line test. And if you put a black line um, on a piece of paper and then you take two colors, let's say quinacridone red, which is a fabulous glazing red, and cadmium red, which is a not so great glazing color. It's really opaque, but it's really great for alaprima painting. And just put them on there. And then you can take a palette knife or your finger or whatever and just drag it across. And you can really see the, the black coming through there when that dries. I would like to argue that the black will just show right through. You won't see the red at all. But with the, the cadmium red, you can see it's much more opaque. And again, we'll let that dry and we'll have a look. But that's the simplest way to test your paint. Um, on a lot of tubes, you'll say transparent, semi transparent, this and that. I always like to test them myself and just, just check to see what you're messing with. 
But basically for my glazing, I've set out um, some of my favorite colors. Quinacridone magenta is a really fabulous, cool glazing red. I've got transparent red oxide, which is what I use for this, which I find is a nice orange. Lemon yellow. Lemon yellow light hands is a really fantastic um, glazing yellow. It's slightly cool. Um, and then I've got an Australian olive green, which um, the chromium green oxide I was saying is the, kind of the, trans, uh, the traditional Velasquez style of priming, but that's because it's opaque. So I wouldn't use that for, for glazing. But the Australian olive green I find is a lot like terra verde, which is um, a very old school glazing color for greens. And it's, um, it's not as saturated as like a phthalo green, so it really makes the landscape sit. And that's what I've used for the grass here. Um, for the majority of that, there's also a bit of ultramarine. So I've got that, and I've got phthalo blue, which is such an intense glazing blue. It's really fantastic and transparent, but it's also super saturated. You want to you be careful um, if you're not wanting to make really pumped up paintings. Uh, ultramarine might be the better glazing blue um, rather than the phthalo. And the phthalo is biased towards the yellow to make a good green. So I've also put the ultramarine on my palette to mix with the quinacridone to make a magenta, to make a, um, a purple, which is really good. So going back to this that I was talking about, I've got the quinacridone magenta mixed with a little bit of transparent oxide red. So it's not quite as cool of a red, more of a, a primary red. I've got areolin, which is a fantastic glazing yellow. Uh, it's a series seven color, so it's fairly dear, but um, it's just a wonderful glazing yellow, just as transparent as can be. Then I've got a green that is a mix of the areolin and the ultramarine blue. And then I've got um, the last one, the phthalo blue, I believe. So you can see how they glaze over the titanium white, over the antique white, and over the unbleached titanium. Um, and then what I did was I put them here um, to show the difference in how the primes affect them. And I find it quite interesting um, that really you want the complementary color. And I talk about this a lot in my videos. Um, I always start with a prime in my videos. If I'm going to paint a painting that's based on greens, I'll do a red priming. And that throws a lot of people off and they often say, you know, why do you start with the opposite color? And it's because the colors are transparent and we're building up with glazes, that's going to give you the most amount of variety. So you can see that um, with this, with this reddish uh, priming, glazing the green over the top, you go from everything from a really nice vibrant green in the highlights um, to a color down here that reminds me a lot of the effects in Tim McGuire's paintings. It's, it's speckled. It's got red and green in it, which I find very interesting. And there are a lot of things um, in the world color-wise that are like that. It's really hard to mimic that mix of colors. So you find that the priming underneath will help that out. Now a green glaze on top of a green priming, you can see, um, is almost like a, putting a colored gel over a light or something. It's just green infused. There's really no variation. And um, same thing with the blues. You can really see the red influencing these blues down there. So these are, are things that I think it's really important to think about when you're making a painting. If you start with a, um, with a ground that it, the decision that you make about this color is based on the color scheme that you're going to build. I think it's, this will give you the most amount of um, variation. Now, you might be wondering what I started this one with. And it's a really moody landscape, and the majority of it is quite subdued in color. So I didn't want to start with too much of a pumped up landscape. But um, I think being as how this is dominated by kind of greens and blues, but also browns, a, brown, a, a red could have worked. But what I did was um, I actually started with carbon black. And this is another technique that I'd like to show you just to give you as many options as possible. I started with a carbon black, and then I took white. I'm taking a bit of spreader medium, which is really the ideal medium for glazing. You don't want to use over 20%, it says on the, the thing, or else it'll start being susceptible to water. But um, just, this is antique white. I'm going to use antique white um, throughout. It's just such a fantastic white, this one. So just get it kind of loose enough to move around with the brush. This stuff almost has the consistency of water, which is fantastic. I painted um, with water for years with my acrylics, and um, I'm starting to be a bit more diligent about the mediums that I'm putting in them now. So this spreader medium is fantastic. And you'll see that if I just quickly move it around,
I get a nice optical gray. And I mean, you might think that that looks really, really white, but as soon as I put an opaque and you squint your eyes, you can see it's really a great mid-tone gray. So that's what I did to, for the, the priming for that one. And I'll just prime this up. It doesn't really need to be totally consistent. It just needs to be approximately the same tone. So if you squint your eyes, you can see that it's approximately the same tone, slightly darker in spots like this, like here, over here. You can quickly remedy that. That's fairly consistent. And that's, um, that's going to dry a nice mid-tone gray. And the advantage of this over mixing white and black to make a flat gray is obviously already about depth, which if you're making a landscape, that's a total advantage. So I really like that technique. I did it on here. I put so many layers on this already, it's really hard to see through. But um, back in that back kind of hill area, you can kind of see it, but it's very subtle. But it's definitely influencing the later layers as this exercise shows. Now, the, um, the other thing that I mentioned was that the old masters used glazing to take advantage of the full range of saturation in their unsaturated pigments. So they didn't have very strong colors. And I just mixed up a couple of things just to demonstrate that. So all of my glazing colors that I mentioned here, um, I have glazed over titanium white. So I wanted the, the strongest kind of glazing effect possible. And then I've got it pure out of the tube at the top so you can see how dark they are as they come out of the tube. And then down here, I've mixed tints of titanium white and those colors to try to get the same tone as the glazed color. And I think you can see that the ones on the bottom are just slightly muddier. They're just slightly dirtier. And um, the ones on the top, just they kind of glow a bit more. They've got a bit more saturation. And it's just that little bit that can um, make the color come out in those little master paintings, which is fantastic. The other thing that I want to point out is uh, what I call the Crayola box theory. And that we, from a young age, we kind of know colors as they come out of the Crayola box. The dark colors are purple, blue, maybe green. Uh, the mid-tone colors are red and orange. And then the, the only light-toned color is yellow. And you can see that here. That's um, the lemon yellow. And as it comes out of the tube, it's already a light tone. But the majority of these are all mid to dark tones. And so if you're going to be making a, a purple painting, um, or if I wanted to paint you standing outside in full sun in that purple shirt, um, you're really going to have to add a lot of white to your purple to get any light into it. And the more white you add to a dark color, the chalkier it seems, the more washed out it seems. And you see that a lot in flesh tones when people are painting the human figure. They'll just add heaps of titanium white into their colors, and it just makes the flesh just look yuck. And so that's the other advantage to using these, um, these glazing techniques is that uh, this, this is a very popular color for glazing flesh, old masters, and in contemporary art, um, the transparent oxide red. And you can see that down here, it just looks uh, like makeup. It looks like foundation. Whereas here, it actually has the feeling that there's life inside of it. I find that very interesting. So um, if you find that you're, you're going to be doing a painting based on colors that are traditionally quite dark, blues and purples, but you want a lot of light into it, you might think about using an indirect technique like that. And the other thing that I, I think is really good for that is painting the ocean or the sky. And because, again, they're not flat. They've got depth to them. They've got variations that we can't quite put our finger on. And the glazing techniques just take full advantage of that, which I think is quite exciting. So I've kind of explained um, about the grounds and about the actual paint. Now I would like to just do some glazing just to kind of show you guys um, how I do it and kind of um, what my thinking process is. This morning, um, I did two self-portraits to celebrate my 35th birthday, which was yesterday. And um, I grew this beard specifically so I could um, test the differences between what I think would be like an orange kind of transparent red oxide glaze for the beard um, and more of a flesh tone for my face. I, I thought that that would be quite an interesting contrast. Um, and then the shirts and the background 
I'll just make whatever color um, I need to make them to bring up the flesh tones. And this is such an important part. This is what I talked about last year in my color theory workshop was um, about simultaneous contrast. And the one thing that um, I find very interesting is that Caucasians um, often don't look so great with purple. Uh, you're the exception. But um, it's, it's a very hard color for us to wear because it brings out the yellow in our skin. And um, people of color, Mediterranean origin or African origin, often wear purple much better. Um, it really brings out a lot of color in their skin. Um, so these are things that we have to be aware of when you're painting a portrait because whatever color I decide to make the background, it's going to influence the look of the color on my flesh. So I'm actually going to wait and do that after I do the flesh tones and I'll be able to tweak that accordingly. So, and by the way, these have dried since I did that test, so I might just show you. You can really see the difference in the transparency of the pigment. So that's just a great test for you to do at home. So to get started with, um, and by the way, I'll just explain how I, the difference in these. Um, they're both a yellow, ochre, black, and white priming, like I explained that Rubens uses. Um, but I found it was a bit dark. You can see it right there in its pure form. So in this panel, I did the same thing that I did with this one. I took white and I stumbled it over the top, and I ended up with this color, this tone. So this is just a lighter tone of priming of this one. And you can, you can see already the difference that it makes in the overall tonality of the painting, the study. And then to create the study, I used transparent oxide red, which I'm going to use to glaze, um, which again is this color. I'm going to use, tra I use transparent oxide um, with a bit of this spreader medium. Um, so you can see when I started out, I had it quite loose because I wasn't sure about the drawing. I was getting things kind of fixed up. And then as I became more confident of my drawing, I put on thicker bits where the darker tones are. Let that dry, and then I, um, I mixed up a bit of antique white and then put that in to get my lights. This is a very kind of traditional way of working. They call it a grisaille, and this is the way the old masters would work and then glaze in on top. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to work on the two different primings to show that I re it really forced me to work in two different ways. In this way, it was quite cut and dry. I could put the darks with the, burnt, uh, the uh, transparent red oxide. I could put the lights with the white. And then I'm actually using the priming underneath from my mid-tones, which is fantastic. Um, the majority of the old masters work that way. With this one, my priming I couldn't use as the mid-tone because it's really a mid-dark tone. So I actually had to stumble white over the dark to try to get a mid-tone. And it's just left this one looking a little bit more chalky and pacey. So that's something that I'm going to have to fight with. And I think it'll be interesting to see how they come up accordingly. So, work. So, I'm just going to grab a bit of spreader medium and get it out to work with. So I'm not dipping into the jar and polluting it. And like I said, I'm just going to start with transparent oxide red as a glazing color. Um, I've already got it here, so, so it's, it's not, not going, going to make a huge difference going over the parts that are already that, that color, color, but it should, it should make, make a difference, difference in the white, so I just want to check that out. Let's have a look. You can, you see, can see there that it got a bit more pigment in it, but that's pretty good for a glaze. You don't really want to see the paint, you just want to see the influence of the color on the white underneath. And, and you can, can see, see that that just warmed that up. It's really fantastic how um, it just <laughs> really mimics the color of the flesh. I did these, um, these two studies of my hand using the same exact colors. And you can just see that the, um, the priming has made this one very red. Um, whereas this one, the green is coming through and balancing out that red and creating kind of an optical orange. And I find especially this part of the wrist to me is a very realistic kind of flesh color. And that's probably got the least amount of paint on the entire painting. So sometimes less is more when it comes to that. But um, the same technique, just on these two different grounds. So I'm going to continue on with the transparent red oxide for the lights. I'm going to hit this one too. I'm just going to go over this part that's been scummed. And it looked chalky before. But now that I've got a glaze on it, 
it looks a bit better. It's still a bit dead, but um, it's interesting. Just under my eyebrow. And I might just add a little bit of quinacridone magenta for the parts on my face that are a bit more red, so the nose, the nostrils, the earlobes, things like that. Don't want to go too red, it looks like I've been drinking all day. But this is the fun of glazing. Um, I'm quite a heavy-handed painter. I've never been a delicate sort. And um, I find that painting a la prima sometimes, I just make mistake after mistake. But the great thing about glazing is you can try it out and you can bring in colors. And if you don't like it, you just quickly wipe them off and they come right off. Um, but things are looking fine. So I'm going to continue. Now, if I glaze over my beard with that transparent red oxide, which is what I was planning to do because it's kind of an orange color, it's just going to match the color of my flesh. So I think I really need to exaggerate that orangeness. So what I'm going to do is to mix a saturated orange with lemon yellow and quinacridone magenta. Bit of spreader medium into it. I'll try to get most of the paint off just so I can try it out. So that's interesting. That's slightly more orange than this. This to me now looks a bit towards the yellow, and that seems a bit more towards the orange. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'll just go ahead and glaze it in the rest of my beard. Now, I've forgotten to do my hand and my arm, so I might just quickly glaze those in, going back to the transparent oxide. And this is the other reason it's good to use um, pure paint out of it, too. Normally, in my regular alpine practice, I like to mix colors because I hate it when you can look at a painting and see, oh, that's this color, that's that color. But for glazing, you don't really notice that that's transparent red oxide. And if you end up having to come back and glaze some other area, you need to remember what you use. So that's one of the reasons why it's great to use it just straight out of the tube. Now also my hands are a bit more red than the rest of me, so I might just add a bit of quinacridone into that to warm it up. That's good. You can see that's just, again, slightly more towards the red-orange than the mustache is. That's really red, but I'll just go ahead and leave it on there because I'd like to make some sort of difference between these two. So there, now we've kind of got some, some flush things happening. The only thing that is really throwing me off is um, my eyes are kind of vacant. And so I wouldn't mind just putting in a small blue glaze just so that's sorted. And I'm going to use ultramarine rather than phthalo because phthalo is just so strong. It's good for certain sure. things. But um, I just want my eyes to be slightly blue. It's a bit weird. So, the whites of my eyes are too white, and that happens a lot in portraiture, you know? People just put straight white on there. 
And um, so you may be thinking, what can I glaze that white with to knock it back a bit? One of my favorite colors to graze is purple, and purple is an excellent glazing color. I don't know if you remember that um, the painting by um, George Innes of the Snowfield with the kind of blue sky. There's a lot of purple glazing in that one. And I can just use my quinacridone magenta or ultramarine blue. A bit of spreader medium. And I can get a purple. Now, if I glaze it with that, I'll have purple eyes. So it's a bit full on. So if I want to desaturate that, all I have to do is add a little bit of lemon yellow and it'll knock back the saturation of the purple. So I don't know if you can see that, but it just turns it into a nice neutral color. And that's a neutral glazing color. If you do that too much, you're just gonna end up with a muddy painting, but in certain parts, it might be useful to have a, an unsaturated color just to knock something back. So, just put that over my eyes, over the whites of my eyes. And that looks a bit better. So now, I might just chuck a glaze on my hair. Um, what to do? Maybe towards the yellow? So I've gone kind of uh, transparent oxide red, which is a yellowish. I've added a bit of red for the mustache, and I've added even more red for the hands. So let's go in the opposite direction and add a bit of lemon yellow to transparent oxide. And it'll just give us a yellowy orange. Bit of medium. see what happens. It's making me pretty blonde. That's all right. Summer's coming around. Just pretend I had a bit of peroxide in there. And it'd be too easy to come back in with uh, like a burnt umber or a burnt sienna and do the shadows in my hair. And that'll really um, bring that up. And also I can glaze that over the yellow then. But working in glazes is a lot like working in watercolors in that a lot of times you want to do your lightest bits, fully saturated bits first, and then bring the shadows in over the top of that. Um, or, you know, we could just take some of this glazing, um, desaturated color into the yellow and see what happens with that. That's probably a bit more realistic, I think. It's not quite as saturated as that last one. So, um, pretty happy with that. And there's still just, it's, it's a bit saturated, I think, because of this underlying transparent red oxide. So the last thing I want to do is to do my shirt. And normally I'd do it in like a blue to bring out the orange in the flesh. But like I said, I think I've already got too much orange anyway. So why don't we use um, like a deep red? Uh, so quinacridone with just a slight bit of ultramarine in it to just be kind of a magenta. And that should bring out the complement of green in my flesh, which will tone down that, that orange red. But we'll try it with one and see how it works. And if we don't like it, we can do a different color for the other shirt. You can see that the, it glazes well over the white and the color really comes up quite quick. Over here in an area where it's much darker, you don't really notice the color so much. You can either use more paint because quinacridone magenta is quite a transparent color. We could use it straight without any spreader medium and we'll get a more bold effect, but it also covers up the, um, the underdrawing. That's not bad. Do you guys feel that that toned those colors down a little bit? Some people are way more sensitive to colors than others. But um, I'm becoming more and more aware of those effects of simultaneous con contrast. But I find that quite interesting. Now, if I go just quickly to the other side and try the opposite color. So let's try green. And that'll bring out the red in my flesh. So rather than using this Australian 
olive green, which is desaturated. I'm going to mix my own out of lemon yellow and phthalo blue to make a really saturated green. There's brimium. It would have less of an effect on the skin tones. So, so it, it would just, just make, make um, it would just make everything harmonize for a, I hate to say that though, because that's the easy way to harmonize your paintings, desaturate everything, but it's not very exciting. Um, having a more saturated green here will have more of an effect on those colors. So I like to do that just to see because I see this as an experiment rather than creating a finished painting. So um, I'm just doing it to see what's going to happen to the flesh tones. But if you're, if you're trying to make a finished painting and you want it to be, um, if you want it to behave in a way, in a manner of speaking, then you might want to use a desaturated color. And I think especially in landscape, when you, when you look at the one behind here that, that I was showing, that's why I used Australian olive green in that one. I didn't want it to, to jump out. But I could, I could very easily be wearing a, a saturated, fully saturated green shirt like that. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. Is it affecting the skin tone at all? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting the difference. You can really notice it in the hand, I think. So, the next thing I could do is to do um, something to the background again to influence it. But um, I'd like to just open up those possibilities for working with color rather than going back and changing your glazes because, um, and that's that's what I've done with this painting, is that I've actually just gone back and done gla glaze after glaze in the background, blues into oranges and so on, trying to get um, the overall feeling of that picture that I showed you of his sunset. So um, you can play with it that way, or I'd like to offer up the other suggestion of playing around with colors in the background to influence your glazing colors. But um, it's a wonderful technique, and it's got a lot of different possibilities and options um, to get really intense results. But I'd like to just think of today's presentation as um, kind of an introduction to the idea of glazing. So hopefully this gives you something to play with and um, some new techniques. Are there any other questions? Feel free. I know it's very, very broad. The, the great thing about this is because we're messing with acrylics rather than oils, you're really not going to do anything wrong that's going to, to ruin the painting. I think the only thing um, that you could do that might end up being frustrating is um, adding too much gel medium. A lot of people think that by watering down their paints that um, they need to put in some more gel medium to keep the strength up. And if you use too much, it just gets too glossy. You can see I've used gel medium and these as the glazing medium. And it's just got that sheen on it. That, um, it may be good if you're like a, a very glossy still life or something like that. But I think for flesh and for landscape, you wouldn't want that kind of sheen. So this um, spreader medium is the go for, for that because it's completely matte. You can see um, it draws really lovely. You don't notice the layer. You just notice the color, which is what you want. So I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, anyone want to mention? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I've just moved down the south coast um, to the little town of Austinmere, north of Thoreau, about 15 minutes north of Wollongong. And we've got a 25 bedroom guest house. And we've turned it into an artist's rumpus room the equivalent thereof. Um, it's fantastic. We've got people dropping in all the time. And we've decided to start um, doing workshops. So my first workshop that I'm going to conduct is an on plain air coastal landscape painting workshop because that's basically what I'm doing there, <laughs> going to the headlands and painting. And um, that's going to take place on the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of November, which I believe is a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So three days and two nights accommodation, um, three meals a day, for $395 for the, the lot, and um, I'm going to be doing demonstrations. I like to do a lot of uh, painting demonstrations, about an hour. I can whack up a painting of the coast and explain the colors I'm using and things. I'll be using both oils and acrylics. I'll probably do 
um, one the first day and the other the second day, so because people will be using both. Um, as far as I know, there's nobody using watercolor yet, but I'm not opposed to the idea. And then um, I'm also going to do lectures in the evening um, around dinner time, um, presentations of um, on plein air painting and the history of it and things like that. And we'll have group, group critiques and individual critiques as well. So three days is quite a long time to do all that, so it should be quite in-depth. So if you're interested, I've um, emailed David the, um, the details and the brochure, and he said that he would pass it on if anyone is interested. So, um, yeah, if you have a look at that, you can get a hold of me on my email address, which is attached to that document, and be great to book you in. Um, or if you're just skipping down the coast and you want to come have sticky meat, you know, come and have a knock or uh, send me an email. It'd be great to show you around the place. I really want to, over the next year, we want to turn it into a place where people can literally just drop in. And we have everything from X Archibald Windows to just people that we know through um, Sydney and through the art scene, just dropping in and having barbecues and having a homebrew or something like that. So. Yeah, all the homebrew is well up and running. I'm brewing a little creatures version right now. Yeah, it's fantastic. It is. It's so yeah, a lot of people at the place have dogs um, where I'm staying, so they get a little off seat for a walk. Kind of. It's fantastic, and it's just it's stunning. Um, looking north, you get a backlit landscape, and looking south, you get a flooded sunlit landscape. So it's got the best of both. And um, as the sun continues through the sky, you get these wonderful changes. So it's going to be really great for that. And then I think also in the summertime, we're going to do some um, figure painting workshops, so like the nude. Um, because in the warmer months, we don't have to worry about heaters and the comfortable, comfortability of the model. So I'd like to do some, land, uh, some workshops on the figure as well. So I'll keep David in the loop with that. And then if people are interested, he can pass it on. Um, so yeah, it'd be great. But the, do you have a website yourself? I do, yep. My name, RudyKissler.com. That's kind of an archive of the last 10, 12 years of my painting. And I've got a blog, which is Rudy on the Run at blogspot.com. And uh, that's my up-to-date, like, I, some, I sometimes when I get in a run, I'll do a painting a day. I whack that up and I talk about where, where I'm at, what I'm doing, and um, keep things up to that. And then also the gallery in Sydney that represents him, Charles Hewitt, he's got um, probably two or three hundred paintings of my last four solo shows there. So he just he called me yesterday on my birthday. He, sold, he said he sold the, the large painting from my last show. It was 